If you're visiting, I want to welcome you here to Grace. Uh, a lot of our folks seem to have taken the day off and went fishing or something. I, I'm not sure uh, exactly what they did, but we're still going to have a good word. And, and um, it'll be the second part in a, in a series I'm calling Fake News. I mean, I hear it every day on the news. I don't know whether to believe it or not. Uh, you get to the point you don't even know if the fake news is fake anymore, you know. It's, it's, it's really messed up. So, um, And as I started putting this together, um, and, and again, I think the fake news that we have concerning Scripture, this is nothing political, but concerning Scripture, is the enemy's a liar. And uh, he wants us to doubt the Word of God, and he wants us to doubt the principles and promises of God. And he will do anything he can to deter us from the purpose of God. And um, he, he wants to rob us of our joy. He wants to rob us of our confidence. He wants to rob us of uh, walking in good standing with God. He wants to make us feel like we're under judgment and wrath and all of this all the time. And um, it's just fake news. And uh, even in, in serving in the church, a lot of people feel that they're not worthy, they're not capable, they're not able. Uh, and sometimes we get into a place of, of uh, apathy because we just feel it's never good enough. You know, that, that's, that's a terrible place to be is when you feel it's never good enough because it's like you lose hope. It like you, you lose your motivation. Have, has anybody ever been there? Yeah. And you just think, what's the point? I'm not good at it anyway. And then the, the more lies the enemy tells, the more defeated you become. And, and that's what fake news is scripturally. Uh, the enemy will will do it to you, and, I, and so I want to I want to give you a clip, and then I'll springboard because I started to analyze this. I thought, why on this particular subject today? Why, why do we, or how do we get in the state of what I'm going to talk about of this fake news? And the clip maybe explains some of it. Uh, I, I think a lot of it is when we lose purpose. When you lose purpose with what God has called you to do and ordained you to be and you're outside that parameter, there really is no purpose that matters because deep down inside you know that you need to do God's purpose. So you have this internal struggle all the time. And if you do not rise up and do what God's told you to do or revealed to you to do or to be who God's called you to be, it creates this incredible struggle and we lose focus because we feel we have no purpose. So watch this and I'll be back and we'll talk about... Uh, what the enemy does uh, with fake news and I'll try to today I'll do fake news and real news how we do the comparison okay and maybe it'll refocus your pur your purpose and you'll get back to the place where you need to be and uh, let's just pray that God right now would speak to our hearts and our minds you know not just speak to us as an audience but I think when we come to church we, we should come with the idea that we want God to speak to us <clears throat> not that just we hear something that's entertaining that we want God to speak to us and, and for us to give God his rightful place in our hearts and our minds and that is control over it. So let me pray right now for our audience that God would use the message and he would use me uh, to do what he'd have me to do. Let's pray. Father, just thank you for the opportunity this morning to stand. What a privilege it is to open your word and proclaim your truths. And Father, I pray today this, this message would, would affect our hearts and our minds and get us back on track to the purpose that you've called us to do, that you've ordained us to be. And uh, just bless every person here, visitor, member, those that are, are truly faithful and committed, those who are on the peripheral that are struggling with spiritual issues. Uh, Father, I pray for those who need for forgiveness. The enemy will certainly let them think that they're not good enough to be forgiven. And we know that's fake news. So... Lord, bless even the clip as it speaks to our mind. And then prepare our hearts for your word with what our mind feels. Open our hearts and our minds to what you'd have us to hear and see. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Watch the clip and I'll be right back. It's always been the same. I stop. I look, I dream, but I don't take the step. History tells us that in times of war, many commanders have given their prisoners the task of digging huge holes and moving the dirt in sacks across the camp. 
then dumping that dirt out in a huge pile. Weeks of digging, moving dirt, hauling soil. And sometimes, just as the hole was dug, as the prisoners could muster some sense of accomplishment, some hint of purpose, the commander would order the prisoners to move the dirt back and fill in the hole they just dug. The epitome of meaningless work. I know I'm not in a prison camp. Right now, my life feels like that. Work, buy, impress, whatever it is that day, I'm not actually accomplishing anything. I have no purpose. I am just digging, moving dirt, making a pile of what? I stop, I look, I dream of something more. It's always been the same, but not today. Today, I take the step. Today, I become more. Today, I realize I have made myself a prisoner. Today, I decide my status does not give me purpose. Today, I decide to love God rather than money. Today, I decide to pursue my creator rather than success. Today, I return to my father. That's so true. Sometimes you think you're in this hole or this pit and you can't get out, and it certainly has to look better on top than it does in the bottom. And I think uh, as we talk about fake news, I want to talk about a couple of things here this morning out of the book of Revelation, chapter number 3. The book of Revelation, chapter number 3, because fake news says God never gets upset with us. And we go through everything and we we're under the assumption that no matter what we do, God is okay. And let's don't think that God doesn't love us because God always loves us and nothing can separate us from God's love. So I don't want to confuse you on that point. But I do think sometimes the fake news says God never gets upset with us and that's just not true. God does get upset with us. He does chasten whom he loves. But even outside the chastening of God, God still gets upset so much so that, that the scripture says that we can make God sick. That's the real news. And we're talking about walking in a wonderful relationship with God, but yet the scripture says that sometimes we can make God sick. And that comes with this, this attitude of lukewarmness. And lukewarmness, I think, comes from a state of mind where we lose purpose. There's no other reason to be lukewarm unless you've lost your purpose. Some say it might be laziness or apathy. All of that comes with losing purpose. As long as there are purpose in front of your eyes, you will not be lukewarm. I mean, because the purpose, if it's in front of you and if you've embraced it, it keeps us on track and on focus to move forward. When we lose purpose, uh, lose, lose hope or the aim or whatever you want to analogy you want to put to it, that's when it starts to affect us and we become ineffective. We become lukewarm. We still come, we still sit, we still listen, 
And we still do some stuff, but it's like, eh, it doesn't matter if I'm here today, I'm not. Eh, it doesn't matter really what they say. Mm, I'm not going to be moved no matter what message, no matter what's going on. I'm not going to get excited, not going to cry, not going to get upset. I'm just kind of going to be in the middle, and I'll do my own thing and let everybody else do their thing. That's, that's lukewarmness. Let me give you some traits or profile of lukewarm people. Uh, Francis Chan in his book, Crazy Love, has a chapter on being lukewarm, and with, in, in that in that book, and I've read the book, and in part of the book, uh, that he thinks the thing that, that, that causes us to lose our zeal or love for God is the lukewarmness. And he does a profile uh, of lukewarmness, and he says this, Lukewarm people attend church regu uh, fairly regularly, either because it's expected of them or because they like the people there. It is what good Christians do. Second thing, second profile. Lukewarm people give money and time to the church as long as it doesn't impinge uh, on their standard of living. If they have a little extra and it's easy and safe to give, they do so. Third profile. Lukewarm people tend to choose what is popular over what is right in conflict. They want to fit in both inside the church and outside the church. They take the middle road. They care more about what people think of their actions than what God thinks of their heart. Profile number four. Lukewarm people don't really want to be saved from their sin. They want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. They don't generally hate sin and are not truly sorry for it. They're really sorry because God is going to punish them. Profile number five. Lukewarm people are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ, yet they do not act. They assume such action is for extreme Christians, not for average ones. These people call radical what Jesus expected as commonplace for his followers. Profile number six. Lukewarm people rarely, rarely share their faith with their neighbors, co-workers, or friends. They do not want to be rejected, nor do they want to make people feel uncomfortable by talking about private issues of religion. Profile number seven, lukewarm people love God, but they don't love Him with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. They would be quick to assure you that they try to love God that much, but that sort of devotion is only for pastors and missionaries and for radical Christians. Profile number eight, lukewarm people want pastors that will point out to them their gifts, but not pastors who will point out to them their sin. I like that one. Number nine, profile number nine, lukewarm people are continually concerned with safety and comfort. This focus on safe living keeps them from sacrificing and risking for God. They don't want to get out of their comfort zone. They're lukewarm. They're fine. Not hot, not cold. Everything's right. Temperature is right where they want to be. Profile number 10, lukewarm people ask, how far can I go before it's considered sin? Instead of how can I keep myself pure as a temple of God's spirit? How much do I have to give instead of how much I can give? How much time should I spend on praying and reading my Bible instead of I wish I didn't have to go to work so I could sit here and be with God longer? Those are the profiles that Francis Chan writes about in his book, Crazy Love. And the Crazy Love title tells how a person should be in love with Jesus Christ because God's crazy in love with you. And I would recommend the book highly for you to be able to read it. But I want to talk about fake news and then give you the real news. Fake news says that God never gets upset with us. Real news says that we can make God sick. Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse number 14. Now, uh, let me give you a little historical background about the book of Revelation. If you start from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 3, you get a historical picture of the periods or church ages in which the church has been in existence. It's seven letters to seven churches. They represent seven historical uh, periods of time and periods of dispensations where the church has gone through certain things. It starts out with Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and of course Laodicea, which is the last church age. It starts out from a church who, who had no awe against it, but they lost their first love. That was the love for the Word of God. The first century church eventually starts to tarnish all the way to the church that has apathy. We are living in the last church age, the church of Laodicea. Uh, it, is, it is one of those difficult periods of time. The pastor of the church was probably Epaphras that we find uh, and Paul talks about in Colossians 1 verse 17 as he writes the letter uh, to uh, Epaphras. He was going to Colossae and he probably started or pastored the church in Laodicea there also. 
It's the last period of God's timetable before the rapture of the church. Now, some of you may not know what the rapture of the church is, but it's when the, the, the church will be taken out of the way and the Holy Spirit will no longer hold back Satan. But there will be a period of time where the church will be raptured or caught up to meet Christ and the Holy Spirit will, will no longer constrain Satan and then the great tribulation will start. It is the last period before Christ returns again. He'll return for his people in the rapture and at the second coming he'll come with his saints to claim what is his. So it's a historical period. The history uh, of Laodicea, before I get into the breakdown, it was a very commercial, uh, industrious city. They were known for commercial banking. There were more millionaires in Laodicea than it were at Rome. So that's, that's a big thing. It was the wealthiest region of Asia Minor. It was known for three industries, banking, of course, and garment production, especially producing black wool. It was very rare, and the sheep there uh, were highly prized, and it was a, a, a garment uh, production city. It's much like New York Garment Center. Uh, Laodicea produced that. Uh, they were also known for medicine, notably ISAV. It's where they produced a cream for people that had eye difficulty. And some of the greatest uh, doctors were from that era, uh, from that area, uh, of that era, and they invented this eye salve that would anoint eyes for all kind of different issues. So it's, a, it's important that you understand. The geography, it's located in the Lucius River Valley, that's southwest of Pergia, near Colossae. Now the reason I bring both of those to play is because... Uh, uh, Laodicea had an inadequate water supply, and they had to build a water duct to get water from Colossae. Colossae had cool, cold springs, okay, where it was, but Pergia had hot springs. And because Laodicea had no water supply, they had to build an aqueduct. The water would come from both of those areas, but it would merge. It would come part cold and then part steaming hot. But by the time it got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm through the aqueduct. And it wasn't really even fit to drink. People would spit it out as it had this brackish uh, kind of taste. One of the things that you notice when you go to a restaurant, a waitress is always constantly wanting to fill your water glass up because they want it cold or they want it a certain way. Nobody likes to drink hot water or lukewarm water. So it's important that, that by the time it got there that it had this, this brackish taste. Now, I said that to say this because dynamic churches are the hope of the nation. Dynamic churches are the hope of the nation. We hear all this fake news, and the fake news could be changed if churches would get on track. And let's just be honest. If the churches in America got rid of their lukewarmness and got on fire for God, we could control everything. And it's not that we want to control everything. It's that we want, we want things to be the way they were supposed to be according to Scripture. But we could control things. We could put people in office that believe the biblical way. And again, we just went through a series on a biblical worldview. But we could control it. But I think we don't control it. And we don't have the dynamic churches that we need to have. Simply, it's because we become lukewarm. And I'm lumping us all in a basket in the church age. I'm not saying this church is lukewarm. I'm not saying if you're visiting your, your home church is lukewarm. I'm saying the church age in which we live is a very lukewarm church age when less than 9% of churches believe in a biblical worldview. You'll have to agree with me. So effective churches bring people to Christ and righteous living. That's what it does. And, and we have to be careful we don't, we don't lose purpose or we don't lose hope. Churches on fire for Christ improve the spiritual temperature of a nation. And I think it's important. We've seen that. Christ addresses a failing church. When he writes his letters, he's writing to a particular church age. And what we have here in chapter 3 is a letter directly from Christ. And he's telling the pastor, Telling John, give it to the pastor of the, of the church, the angelos, the messenger, and it's to be read out loud in the church. And it would to be read at a, as a circuit. Each one of these letters were read in these seven cities. And each one understood when the letter was there, it did not mean that it was part of church history. It was a letter that was read, but as time is gone, we see how each letter pertains to seven periods of the churches leading up to chapter 4 where the Spirit says, come up here and the rapture of the church happens. Because after, chapter, after this church, no longer is the church mentioned anymore in chapter 4 all the way to the end of the book. It's never mentioned again. It's never mentioned again. 
So this is the last stage in which we live. And, and he's addressing a failing church. And the church lay out to see a look good, but it lacked spiritual power. It looked good, but it lacked spiritual power. Now remember, a church is not a building. A church is comprised of the people that are in the church. So if it lacked spiritual power, it meant there was a problem with the people. Don't get real quiet on me because I'll throw something at you. Amen. I mean, I don't, I don't like to hear this any more than you do. Because we're, we're in this church age together. And the responsibility is grave on someone who proclaims the message of God. Because, I, you know, it's, I could, I, I, my life would be a whole lot easier if I told you all the things that you want to hear. It would be a whole lot better. I can tell you how good you are, how wonderful things are, and how everything's going to be great. You're never going to have any problems, and, and, and because you're a believer, you're never going to have any health issues. But it's a lie. That's fake news. When you trust God, you've got to deal with truth. And it's, a, it's, a, it's uncomfortable sometimes to deal with truth. Truth about our sin, truth about repentance, truth about our attitudes, truth, truth about our service, uh, truth about anything that deals with Scripture. It is difficult sometimes. And the church at Laodicea looked good but lacked spiritual power. It was a church that fooled the public but not the Savior. So it's important that you understand. It's important that you understand what fake news can be. I'm going to give you the real news. We can make God sick. Point number one. Point number one before I read the scripture. You can go through the motions and no one will know. That's fake news. I can fool everybody. Nobody will know, but that's a lie. Because the real news is the all-knowing Christ knows. So let's go to Revelation chapter number 3. And he says in verse 14, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now we learn how Christ introduces himself to the church here. He's writing a letter to the church, and what he's saying is that I am the amen. In the old days, when I started preaching, and believe me, that's when Noah was gathering the gopher wood for the ark, way back, and buckets of pitch to put on it. When I started preaching, amen was a commonplace thing in the church. So amen simply means that you're verifying it is true. In Isaiah 65, 16, he is called the God of truth. Here the word truth is from the Hebrew word amen or amen. We say amen, but it means it is truth. So when a preacher would preach and it would be the word of God, the people would receive it. They would all quote in unison or on their own. They would validate with liberty saying amen. And we can see with the spirit of Laodicea that not many people even want to validate that it's the Word of God. All rights, amen, too. <laughs> truly, truly is amen. Verily, verily. And when it's done twice, it's the greatest emphasis that people, uh, that Scripture puts on it, okay? So, uh, amen is the best, to my knowledge, translated here only in the uh, Old Testament. Uh, as it is in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 65, 16, as that word, amen. Literally, Jehovah is the God of the amen. He is the faithful and true one, the amen of God. Only, he only can add amen to every word he utters. So when he, he writes the letter, he says, he says, these things says the amen, the one that it's truth. He, he's the only one who can utter it. It would be difficult to find a more fitting word to describe the God of the Bible. Many uh, uh, search great libraries in existence, and, and, and if, if you like to read books, you can ramsack and go through records of literature the world over, and you will never find another person being called the Amen, the one that it's true. Because the word Amen, as he gives title to himself, it's reference to his truth. He is the Amen. This title is equivalent to his words where he says, I am the truth in John 14, 6. His ministry of words and works fulfills every promise of God. So in other words, when God speaks, everything God says is true. Every promise of God we find in 2 Corinthians 1, 20, for all the promises of God are in Him are yes, and in Him, amen. That means they're true. So as he introduces himself, he's talking about truth. 
Uh, we've been going through the book of John in, on Wednesday night, though it's been a struggle to keep the continuity. I was back in it this week, and the truth of the book prevailed again as two people come to Christ. It's a powerful book. But in the study of the Gospel of John, John uses the same term where he says amen or amen or verily, verily, 25 times. And if you come on Wednesday nights, you'll be able to hear that. And I could give you all the listings from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 21. We'll find 25 times he says truly, truly, or amen, or verily, verily. All meaning the same thing, that it's true. These verses show the frequency with which Christ used the word when introducing some great revelation of the mind of God. And he's saying, amen, amen. It is true, it is true. He only could say this, okay? Now, it's important that we understand it because he also says that I am the one that is truth and he is the faithful witness. He is the faithful one and everything is true in him. He is the true witness where he says, these things says the amen, the faithful and true true witness, the beginning of all creation. So it's, it's important that we understand that in Christ, every promise, every word that he has ever said is true. So you, this morning, you don't have to really take what I'm saying and validate it as truth. What you need to do is look exactly at what Christ is saying and then validate that as truth. So fake news says, you can go through the motions and no one will know, but real news says the all-knowing Christ knows. Because remember, this church had everything going for them. Now look what he says as we look at a couple of verses. These things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He says, I know your works that you're neither hot nor cold. Now the reason he's giving reference, the people in Laodicea understood about the water. Comes from cold, comes from the, the hot springs. By the time it, get, it gets there, it's lukewarm. It was terminology they understood. I love how the Word of God and the Holy Spirit always brings the terminology that we can understand. When we say we don't understand, sometimes we put our own mental block because we don't want to understand. But they can understand, and he says, I know your works. Now, if he knows their works, and this is a prophetic church age, that means that reference is not only the church of Laodicea, but it's the church period of Laodicea, and we're part of that church. If he knew their works, he knows our works. And some of you stand saying, where do amens go, by the way? And by the way, oh me doesn't qualify. <laughs> because immediately self-examination comes in it. Instead of the amens, now all of a sudden we have to put on the brakes and we say, oh wow, or oh me. Because if he knows our works, it puts us in jeopardy sometimes with fulfilling our purpose. Because if we're honest in our heart, we will know better than anyone else that we're not fulfilling our purpose. Three amens. And it's true. But the problem is, we're like John, uh, as John says... If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You say, well, not doing the purpose of God is that sin? Well, James says it this way, the brother of Jesus, a man that knows to do right and do it not to him, it is a sin. If you know the purpose of God and you're not doing it, the creator over the creation, and you're not doing it, I'm, I'm just letting you in on some truth. This is not fake news. This is the real news. Then guess what? It's a sin. If you know you should be in ministry, then you should be in ministry. And if you're not, it's a sin. Now, I don't rate sins, big sins, little sins. I just know it's a sin. Now, if you ask my opinion, would you rate it as a little sin? I just, yeah, it's a little sin, but still sin. And the wages of sin is what? Okay, I didn't say it. God did. I don't know how to work it out. Only thing I can do is identify with it, okay? But the church of Laodicea, they look good, but they lack this power. And he introduced himself to the church, and he's faithful and he's true. And see, the fake news says no one will know, but real news says he's the all-knowing Christ. Christ is unchangeable. He's the amen. He knows. He knows everything about you right now. And fake news says you can fool God. You say, I don't believe that. Yes, you do. Because we live that way. I'm guilty. You're guilty. We're all guilty. That's why Jesus said there's none good. No, not one. <laughs> Quoting the Old Testament Scripture, Paul writes in the book of Romans, there's none good, no, not one. None of us. Our heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. That's called the depravity of man. Now, and I'm saying that to say that how horrible we are. I'm identifying that's our nature. That is who we are. That's what sinners do. And we have to have God to come in and change our heart. 
And even when our heart is changed, we can grow cold and indifferent and sometimes lukewarm. And see, he is faithful and true witness. He, you know, he keeps his promises. Here's the one thing that gives you purpose. And, and I, I don't have any difficulty, believe me, I don't have any difficulty trusting and believing in the promises of God. They're true. They may not always be applicable to me, but I believe they're true. In other words, uh, God may have a, another purpose in it. The word is true, but he may have a purpose for me in something that I don't see as true, or I don't have the fulfillment of the promise yet, so thus I deem it as not true. And I don't know the end result where God does, but I do know this, they're all true, and they're all yes, some conditional, some unconditional being the promises. But I do know I can rely on the word of God and I can rely on God and, and, and I know he is faithful and he is true and I have no difficulty relying on God. My difficulty comes in relying on people. And we get so disillusioned that we lose purpose because people will rob you of your joy and we'll let the enemy influence us with what the people do instead of what God has done. So now we're looking at the people instead of looking at God. And we're looking around and say, why do I have this? And they don't, and they're living like the devil, and I'm trying to serve you, God. What's the point? And we get lukewarm. What's the point? I've lost my purpose. And, uh, or, or, God, I got this talent, and nobody will ask me to do anything. Around here, we're not, we're not going to ask you to do very much. But if you ask us for something to do, we're going to put you to work. I don't think you ought to have to beg anybody to serve Jesus Christ. I don't think you have to beg, plead, borrow, and steal. I'm not the type. If I have to ask you to help me, I'd rather just do it myself. Now, I know that's not a good attitude, but that's just how I'm wired. And the whole time I'm doing it, I'm praying. I wish somebody would come and help me. Amen? <laughs> but my pride will get in the way, and I won't ask sometimes. And you, you're the same way. So if you're sitting waiting for us to ask, that's probably not going to happen. But if you're really diligently wanting to serve God, you ask us and we'll plug you in. You say, I don't know if I agree with that concept. Well, why not? You should be zealous and eager to serve God and to get out of your state. See, he's the faithful and true witness. He's the beginning of all creation. The one in whom creation had its beginning. John 1, 3 says, all things were made by him. There's nothing made that was not made by him. Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created. He is the beginning of all creation. There's nothing, look, if he created everything and he's saying this to validate, I know everything about you. When you sin, you don't fool me. When you fall out of fellowship, I don't get shocked. When I called you to ministry and you didn't surrender, I didn't make a mistake. You are the one at issue because you didn't surrender. When I give you an opportunity through grace, to be saved and to join my bride and to have an opportunity to serve me, it is not me not giving you the service opportunity, it's you not taking on the willingness to serve me. Because it's, grace is abundant. There's no sin that you've ever committed that he won't forgive. There's no condition that, that disqualifies you from serving him. I don't care if you've been in the grossest sin. If you repented of that sin, you are still able to serve Christ. You don't have to have a great ability to serve Jesus Christ. I could tell you story after story after story after story of the simple people who do the, the mundane task from taking the trash out to, to answering the door, and they got just as much reward as the one who thinks they're so smart about Jesus. You get no more reward for being super smart about the things of God than being humble and just serving God with what you have. The last will be first, and the first will be last. Too much is given, much is required. But it disqualifies no one. I think there's great value in the person that says, I'll just take the trash out. That'll be my job. I can tell you about old Nick Southers. who used to do that brother Southers at youth camp uh, where my kids went to youth camp. And uh, he worked the kitchen. He emptied all the trash. He cleaned the tables. He cleaned the kitchen up while they were out playing. And that's all he did. And he was an older gentleman. That's all he did every summer for over 20 years. He was the trash man at Beulah Land Camp. I could tell you story after story after story who people who had mundane tasks, but there's great reward in heaven. Great reward in heaven. You don't have to have a great ability. See, Christ is not deceived by the church appearance of success in this church. These, because look, look what it says. Well, look what they say. He says, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. 
So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you or spit you or spew you out of my mouth. So fake news says we never do anything to make God upset with us. Real news says we make God sick sometimes. Now, I know he's giving an a, a allegory here. He's, he's, he's giving us just a, a symbolic idea because uh, I don't think God's really puking. But I think it's a state of mind where that in our lack of service, our apathy, our just sitting, constantly doing nothing for the one who done everything for us. He says it just, just, just makes me sick with the metaphor. And that alone should break your heart. Because fake news says, oh, everything's fine, everything we come. You know, most people come to church because they have friends. And they see them at church. And that's okay. I, I hope you do have, there are some people who come to church don't have any friends. And we need to pray for them separately too. <laughs> Amen. Some, some of it registered a little slow for some of you. But, but a lot of people come to church because they want to see their friends. And, and I, that, that's okay, that's good, because in that, you're going to get some word of God. But I really think the main reason we should come to church is so that we can worship Him. And find opportunity to serve Him. And not come just to get, but to come to give. Come to give. And I don't just mean your money. Because we're not about money here. We don't, we don't, we, you'll never get a thing in the mail from me begging you to give some money. We don't have to have stewardship campaigns here and we bring other people in to put you under pressure and get you to buy bonds and do all this kind of stuff. We don't do that. Not, I don't think it's our job. I think the Holy Spirit should convict you over your giving. I'll teach you what the Bible says about it, but I don't teach on it very often because basically you get it. You do. I don't teach a whole lot on, on a lot of those principles because that's not my job. It's the Holy Spirit's job. I just teach as it comes up in Scripture. Whenever the time hits there, that's when we do it, okay? So Christ was not deceived by the appearance. He knows what's going on in all churches. And, and by the way, it doesn't take the smartest tool in the shed to look around and see the same people doing the same thing all the time. You say, why do they do it all the time? Because nobody else will do it. Dawn just said we got a VBS coming up. Some of you have never served in VBS. Try it. You'll like it. Try it. You'll like it. You might have to have a nerve pill by the end of the week, but try it. You'll like it. <laughs> the greatest part of your day will probably be 2 o'clock when it's over that afternoon. I find that odd when we go through it. Everybody says, man, I'm glad this day's over. But I find it also odd that every Friday when it's over, everybody cries because it's over. And all the kids have had a great time, and the workers are the ones that end up being the most blessed. That's just odd. What a paradox. Man, this is a struggle every day. These little kids are driving me crazy. I like to come to snack time. That's my favorite. I show up at snack time. <laughs> but you go and watch all the rooms. You do all the work. And then come Friday night or, or, or Friday afternoon when it's all over. And everybody says, this was so good. I wish it could go on and on and on. Make yourself available. You'll be, you'll be shocked how good it is. And see, he knows what's going on in churches. He sees beyond the buildings and the budgets. And, you know, uh, our budget's good. We always make budget. Maybe I ought to raise the bar so that we don't make it and put you on a faith thing, right? Amen? But Christ saw how little passion this church had for God and souls. Again, I'm not, I'm not saying that's you. I'd never do that. I'm saying it's a church age. When some of our biggest churches never give an invitation... Some of our largest churches in the city and in the country never give an invitation. tells me they're not concerned about souls. They're concerned about crowds. And they're concerned about how it's perceived. And they don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to offend anybody either, but that's not truth. That's not dealing with sin. Sin's uncomfortable. Amen? Sin is uncomfortable. I, I, and dealing with hell, that's uncomfortable. That is not popular. Nobody preaches on hell anymore. Some people don't even believe it. There are people in the church that don't believe it. They want to believe in heaven, but they don't want to believe in hell. But let me give you a secret. Jesus preached more on hell, taught more on hell than he did heaven. So it tells me there's some real doctrinal truths that need to be taught sometimes. It's an amazing thing. He saw how little passion they, they were going through the motions, checking the, the box. This is serious stuff. They were going through religious motion. Well, I went to church. I'm okay. Going to church does not make you okay. 
It's symbolic of you being okay. But going to church doesn't make you okay. What makes you okay is, is your heart is right with God. That you have spent time with God, you've analyzed your spiritual condition, and, and you, you're now making that right. Should Christians come to church? Absolutely. The Scripture teaches it. It's part of the history of who we are. Where we're part of each other and we encourage one another and we're, 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 we build up each other's faith. We find out what's going on in your life and we see how God is moving and it encourages us. I hope you'll be encouraged. I, I've got cancer, but I don't have it. I got it, but I don't have it. I'm going to be cured. I'm claiming it in Jesus' name and by the very fact that God is able and I want to encourage your heart and I want you to be a part of it. I want to stand on this platform in my pink shirt and tell you I don't have cancer no more. And if you call me a sissy for wearing that thing after beating cancer, I'm going to punch you in the mouth. Amen? <laughs> Pink will have a new meaning for me. That's why we assemble together. And by the way, I'm going this Wednesday, and we're going to do battle with that thing. I'll be in Miami. You need to pray Wednesday at noon. You need to pray. They put everything where they're supposed to put it, and they don't put it anywhere else. Amen? <laughs> it's important. So Christ was disappointed in them, and he told them so. Now remember, he's the faithful and true witness. He's the amen. What is your spiritual temperature? Ask yourself this question. How would Jesus view you? How would Jesus view you? Now, I didn't, I'm not asking the question. I said ask yourself the question. If the spiritual thermometer was used this morning, what would it read? Would it read that you're hot on fire for God or that you're cold or indifferent? Or you're just so cold it doesn't matter or you're kind of lukewarm just riding the fence? As you analyze this, and if you don't get the answer that would be pleasing to the Lord, you know what you should do? Well, you're going to find out what you should do. Let me give you fake news number two. Still with me now? Say amen. I'm not trying to get deep and I certainly don't want to be hard because I am guilty. We're living in the same church age, you know. Uh, I could preach harder, I could preach louder, I could preach longer, but you would fire me. And uh, uh, there's more that I could do. I'm as guilty as you are at times in my life because it's just the age, folks. This is where the enemy, Satan, is running rampant right now. He's breaking down the home, he's breaking down the church, he's breaking down the countries. Uh, it's chaos out there. We live in a bad world right now. It's bad. I've never seen it this bad. From school shootings to, to homes falling apart, there's no difference from the world divorce rate than the church rate. It's the same. It's terrible. And it, it's the enemy. He is trying to destroy us. So here we have, we have a good word from a loving Christ. And see, fake news says you don't need anything or anyone. The real news is this awesome church and the needs of this church. The awesome needs of this church. Look at verse 17, what Jesus says. Jesus says this. He said, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are blind and wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness would not be revealed, and to anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Fake news says you don't need anything. That's what the enemy wants you to think, or you don't need anyone. Stay home. Watch church on TV. You don't need the church. I totally disagree with that. I think if you occasionally are at home and you do stay home, then you should watch some church on TV. But I don't think it should be your habit or your practice. Amen. Amen. I'm encouraging you if you're home, and there are people home today, and I'm sure some of them are being ministered to by people much better than I. But this is your, this is your body of believers. You're part of this body. We're all part of the body. We all are fitly joined together. What I do, you may not be able to do. What I do... Uh, Justin may not be able to do, but I can certainly not do what he does. You want to try it some Sunday? You will know that I'm telling you the truth. Amen? And you want to see that brother preach? You'll say, let, Justin, you sing, Pastor Mike will preach. 
I'm not saying he's not qualified. I'm just saying his gift, and he knows it, he's known it since he was a young child, is that of worshiping in song. That is his gift. That is his gift. I knew when God called me what my gift was. I used to pray for the gift of singing. And it never came. <laughs> and this is one time God says, no way. No way, no way will you ever be able to carry a tune in a bucket. Amen. Aren't y'all glad? And he also did this. He said, but I will give you discernment to let you know you can't sing. Because there's some people that can't sing and they don't have the discernment to understand they can't sing and we all get punished. And I've had, I've had people say, well, why don't you let them sing? And they make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Well, then you get in the shower and you just sing away. But in the body, we want to edify the body. We want people that have a gift that glorifies God, not where all of us say, oh, me, oh, my. And we, you can always tell if it's good because if you start reading, you'll see everybody look down and they start doing something. They don't want to be embarrassed for them. So to take the embarrassment away, we use people that have the gift. You still with me? Yeah. But see... Members of this church, they saw themselves that they were good and increased with goods and they don't really need anything. See, the thing that we need is not the goods. The thing that we need is Him. We need the presence of His Spirit in our life, not the stuff. That's a hard lesson to learn, especially if you've never had stuff because you were so deprived as a child, you think stuff brings happiness, but it doesn't. You know what brings real happiness? Is knowing you're smack dab in the middle of his will and serving him. And that's not just preacher talk because I've been on both sides of the fence. I've worked three jobs to buy stuff for my kids, to go to school, to do all these things. I worked three jobs. And I'd do it again if I had to do over. But the one thing that, and I used to say I love the word of God, but I found out the more time I spent trying to do these other things, the more I fell out of love with the God of the word. And I don't want anybody else to make that mistake. You can say, I love the Word of God, but look, the Word of God, you have to be in love with the God of the Word before you can ever love the Word of God. Because if you don't love the God of the Word, the Word of God will just be a sham. It'll just be some intellectual ascent that you made. But when you fall in love with the God of the Word, the Word of God will be precious to you. And you'll know what God requires, and you'll have a purpose. Will you stray sometimes? Will you fall? Will you stumble? Absolutely. But see, it's the Word of God that will pick you up convict you of your sin help you regain your purpose they thought they were good they boasted of being rich and increased with goods they have needed nothing and see churches can make tragic trades they trade spiritual fire fineries uh, and, and prayer for possessions they start to say let's have a program let's do this and let's do this and they lose their spiritual fire listen to me every time somebody gets saved you ought to be rejoicing because there's rejoicing in heaven and sometimes I think we have a longer invitation and God is moving. I think people say, man, I wish they'd hurry up. I like it, but why do we got to do that at the end? Amen. That's why I do it in the beginning sometimes. God's going to do what he's going to do. But he always does it better after the word of God has been planned because it's powerful and it's the gospel and the salvation. That's why we do it at the end. We give them the gospel and people get saved because the power is not in the service. The power is in them hearing the gospel. But I think sometimes we do that when we do baptize. People are quick to hit the door and say, man, I've got to hurry up and go eat. I'm, my stomach's growling. Amen. You understand what I'm talking about? So it's not about the stuff. And, and uh, you know, they, they, they had a, a great need there. They had a great need. I think we need to pray more. I think we, we don't pray near enough. And churches have kind of given up the prayer meetings and the prayer time and the private time with God. Trading the power of God for the prestige of men. You know where the power of God comes for a preacher? Not being afraid to preach it. That's where the power of God comes. Because there is no saving power in me. There's nothing. I can't forgive one sin that you've ever done. I can forgive you for an ought or wrong you brought against me, but I can't forgive you of one sin because I'm a sinner too. I don't have the ability to do that. I can let you go of what you've done to me, but I can't forgive you of your sin. I didn't pay your debt. Christ did. But you know where the power comes from a preacher? Who will preach the truth of God because God is the true and faithful witness. 
and truth sets you free. And I, I shouldn't have to worry who, uh, who, who's going to get upset because of truth. As long as I stick to truth, I'll be fine. But there's too many that have compromised that. We've traded the power of the Word of God for the prestige of men and trading powerful preaching for partisan politics, you know. Why don't you speak out on this? Why don't you speak out on that? Look, I'm not a politician. I'm a preacher. I will mention occasionally that, but I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat. What I care about is you saved or lost. Amen? We all should be independents and just vote for the guy that stands for the book, and then we wouldn't have to worry about any of it. Amen? Praise God. Amen. Because fake news is everywhere. This church appeared to be rich, but it was spiritually poor. Appearances can be deceiving. Again, I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about people. You might say you're okay and you can fool people, but inside you're dying. And he knows. You ever been there? Man, I've had to put the fake face on so much. People ask me, are you okay? You okay? Well, I'm okay. I have confidence in God. But it's, it's tough to hear you got cancer. I'm going to be honest. That, that, that'll, that'll rock your world, man. Boom. I'm just, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm praise God. I got to be in the running for a, a diagnosis and a cure. That, I want a record. Boom. Pow. But I, you know, I'd wake up every morning, and first thing that before I put my feet on the ground, the enemy would say, you got cancer. And I'd have to say, I don't care if I got cancer or not. I'm going to live today like it's my best day. And it's hard. It is hard. And it's hard to stay on track sometimes. And people say, are you good? You good? You, some of you walked in this morning and you said you were good. You had that fake smile on. I asked several people, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm good. I had some people ask me, are you good? I don't ever say I'm really good. I say I'm hanging in there. Because that's the truth. I'm, I'm hanging. I'm hanging. I'm hope, I'm, I hope I ain't hanging after Wednesday. I hope it's all good. Amen? So, but I use the term hope because I don't know what the outcome would be, but I'm trusting I'm like that guy, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. <laughs> Amen. That's how we are. He knows. I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. You know what you should do when I ask you, say, hey, Pastor Mike, I am struggling. Will you pray for me? And so say, I'm good. I'm good. You know what? When you say I'm good, you know what that is? Pride. You've bought into the lie of the enemy that says that you're good and you're dying inside. God knows you're dying inside. Why not go before the throne of grace with somebody and find grace and help in your time of trouble? But see, the enemy will say, tell them you're good and you're not good. When you should be going to the throne of grace with a, with a, with a, a, a seasoned believer, let's say, let's take this to the Lord because he's able. With God, nothing's impossible. And then when somebody says, are you good? I'm good now because he's got it. Because I cast all my care on him because he's cared for me. See, the enemy don't want you to cast your care. And we'll be lukewarm and we'll not even approach the throne of grace and we'll walk around defeated. Our butt will be kicked spiritually. We'll look like the, the wimpy kid. You ever seen the Wimpy Kid books? The little stick man on the front? And he's never straight up right. He's always been over. <laughs> Your kid, you tell them they can't have something, they'll immediately get Wimpy Kid look. <laughs> Sometimes husbands, wives will do the same thing. No, baby, we can't buy that today. <laughs> and quite the other. Baby, are we going to rendezvous this week? She said, I can't this week. <laughs> the men will do the same thing. <laughs> Amen? We all get the wimpy kid look. That, that, that's how it happens. But see, when you take your petitions before God, you're no longer a wimpy kid. You can be empowered, and you can be on fire for God knowing that He's got this. No matter what it is, with God, all things are possible. I have learned, I have learned because I've been put in the fire that you can depend and trust in the Lord. And all of his promises are true. And Jesus recommends the following. He said, he says this, I counsel you to buy from me. You think you're rich? You think you got stuff? Buy, buy this from me. Look what he says. I love this, this metaphor. To buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. You don't know what it's like 
when people are in the fire to you've been in the fire yourself and let me tell you Jesus was in the fire before us and he knows exactly what we go through because he's our great high priest and he experienced everything that we could ever experience as far as emotion or a negative thing. Tempted in all points, but yet knew no sin. Rejected and despised of men. Unloved, hated, put to the cross, murder, spit on, you name it. Didn't even own a house. Had no place to lay his head. Joseph and Mary owned the house. Jesus, we find no record. We find nothing a material substance that he had. And he said, look, he said, try me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments because they were famous as a garment center, uh, but they were famous for black wool. And he says, look, what you get from me will be white robes. It'll be a white garment. You know what that testifies of? You'll have his righteousness. He'll cover you. He'll forgive you of your sin. He'll, he'll restore your purpose. He'll put his white garments on you the white garments of His righteousness. And when God looks at you, He doesn't see you in something that's dirty and naked and wretched. He sees you as covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Scripture calls that imputation. He imputes that to us. He says, try me. Try me. And then He goes on and He says, He says, He says, the eye salve, spiritual eyes and perception. They had the medical deal there and they were famous for the eye salve that they would point on. And he says about this church. And see, the problem with the church age in which we live, we're blind. We can't see. We, we don't see our own sin. We don't see the sin of the church age. We, 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 we compromise. We don't see the Word of God the way that we should see it. And we're blind. We're spiritually blind. And see, the, and that's why we, we so often point to someone else because it's easier for us to see them than to see our own sin. But before you start looking at someone else, look at yourself first. Look at yourself first. When you point that finger, just remember, there's three pointing right back at you. If we would start with ourselves, with spiritual eyes, he said, try of me. Do you, do you see the graciousness in it? it? said, you're trying your own way, but try me. Mine's been refined in the fire. I've been put to the test, and I passed the test. That's why the victory is no longer yours. The victory is His, and you can have victory because He was victorious. He is your example. You can have spiritual procession. And Jesus warned of rebuke and chastening unless changes were made. In verse number 19, He says this. He says, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may, may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eyes, that you may see. And He says this in verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I rebuke and chasten. He said, now look, you need to get some correction. Understand what He's saying here. You need to get some correction. And he's, he's going to explain it. But he says, because I love you. I love you. And it's not because I don't love you, but there's some rebuke. In other words, rebuke is mean I'm going to say some things that you don't want to hear. And the correction part is that I'm going to put some things in action that you will do what I say. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and therefore be zealous and Repent. He gives an exploration, an exhortation, and an invitation. He says, look, if you have had the spiritual thermometer put to you, and it's not reading where it should be, I wish you were the hot or cold, but you're lukewarm and you make me sick. He said, look, get on the fence. You're either for me or against me. Get, get, get on the side and get to where you need to be and get off the fence because that's what you, where you need to be. Because if you don't, rebuke and chastening's coming. Have you ever had the chastening of the Lord? <laughs> it's not good. I've had people say, well, I'm mad at God. I'm not going to go to church because I'm mad at God. You just don't understand. Well, let me tell you this. You will not win that fight. You can be mad for a lifetime, and you're not going to win that fight with God. And you being mad at Him ain't going to change anything. It's just going to hurt you more. You will be the one who suffers. You, you, never try to do battle with God. You will lose. Amen. Matter of fact, the scripture says God laughs at our calamity. 
We get so smart, we think we can do what we want. We start, we, we, our life just goes a wreck, and God's just saying, uh huh, I told you, told you, uh huh, uh huh, yeah, I told you. Try me as gold tried in the fire. Put on the garments, open your eyes, repent. We think that's such a bad word, that's a good word. I don't know how many times I've said it in this church. Churches look at it like it's a negative thing. People need to repent. Repentance is not coming and praying a prayer. Repentance is putting God at His proper place in your life. It's not, not checking the box. I'm sorry I did it. I'm sorry. And then we're not really sorry that we did it. Look, when you truly repent, you realize this. God against you and you alone have I sinned. And God, I displeased you. And if you've hurt somebody else along the way, you'll do everything you can to try to make it right. That's true repentance. You'll turn from it and put God in His proper place in your life. Let me give you fake news number three. It's real quick. God doesn't care about you. That's fake news. Real news, the affectionate knocking of the Savior at the door in verse 20. After the rebuke, after the, the, the admonition, and after telling them, look, I know what's going on in your life, and... You know, where you're at right now is just not a good place. And we get the, we get the metaphor that you, you just make me want to vomit you. Now, now, again, you can never lose your salvation. He just said, you make me sick. Make me want to throw up. You ever been in a situation where your stomach is just always messed up because things are not right? We eat Tums now. We, we are keeping the antacid uh, calcium companies in business as, as America. More people are eating Tums and stomach disorders than any time in the history of the world. And by the way, that's not good for you. My son told me last night, that's, that's bad for you. And here's why. Our stomachs stay messed up. Because we don't open our spiritual eyes and make things right where we no longer have an upset stomach. We're worried about our spiritual state, but we don't want anybody to know. And repentance is a good word. It is a good word. It, 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 it is a, it's a symbolic of Jesus saying, get it fixed. Come to me and I'll fix it. He said, try of me, gold, tried in the fire. The Lord turns to individuals. Check this out. I love this. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Here's the sad thing that I get out of this. He's talking to the church, but he's not in the church anymore. He's outside the church. You're the church. We're the church. And we've taken Jesus from inside the church and put him outside. And he says, behold, do you see his graciousness? He's not angry. He's still standing there knocking. He's knocking. Fake news says, God doesn't care. Real news says, the affectionate Savior is knocking on the door of your heart. He does not knock like one looking for opportunity. He just keeps knocking. He never goes away. He does not know like a salesman for his own profit. He knows and he knocks because he desperately wants in to be part of your life. He's not trying to sell you a bill of goods. He knocks and calls out to each one offering to come in. Look what he says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, we've closed him out. When a child gets saved, we say we got Jesus in our heart. He comes into our heart of salvation, but somewhere along the way, because of our lukewarmness, not hot nor cold, we find that we have this picture that He is on the outside trying to get back inside. And let's be honest, there are times that we feel like there's no resemblance of Christ in our life. We go through the motions. It's sad. We put Jesus outside the church, being the people are the church, and He knocks affectionately. And here's the sad thing, not everybody will open it. He says, if you'll open the door, I'll come in to him and dine with him and he with me. See, 
He knocks and He opens the door and it brings eternal life and it brings fellowship and it brings restoration. There's nothing better than a good dinner with a great friend, right? There's nothing better. Abraham was called a friend of God. Jesus says that after a point of being a disciple, He said, I call you friends. I call you friends. And he just said, open the door. Let's have some fellowship. Let's get, let's get restored. Let's sit back down to dinner. Come and dine. Let's find out how things should be. And how should they be? Your relationship with Jesus Christ should be better than the day you got saved. The day you felt all of your sins forgiven and your burdens lifted and the new hope and the light that came on in your heart that day, your relationship with Christ today should be much greater than that. It should be a spiritual renewal at a dining table that, uh, and, and the picture is that of a banquet table and, and you're just having the best time with the Lord. You're not walking around in fear. You're not walking around not believing God's word. You're walking about excited about what he's saying. You're, you're, you're walking about with everything. You're just eating it up spiritually. You're, just, you're longing for the word of God. You're longing for the presence of Christ. The songs that we sing the, the, uh, about his presence, about his, his, his being so rich and full in our lives, they all have new meaning. So where are you at today? Fake news? You want to believe it? You're going to be headed for trouble. Real news is, repent, turn back to Christ, and have a great time of fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Bow your heads with me. Father, I just thank you for the, the sweetness of your invitation. That you are knocking at the door of every heart in this place right now. I thank you for the sweetness of it. There's no judgment. There's no condemnation. You said even if rebuke comes and chastening comes, it's because you love us and it's a good thing. Father, I ask you to speak to every heart in this place about their spiritual condition. Father, we know if we're lukewarm. We know if we've shown little faith. We know if we have apathy that it doesn't matter. And Father, I pray for each and every person who's had those thoughts. I pray for the person that sin has got them off course. I pray they'd repent. Put you back in the rightful place in their heart. I pray if our attitudes are not what they need to be because they'll drive us to this state of lukewarmness. I pray for purpose for every person in this building to glorify and to serve you for every opportunity in life that it would be to give you glory. It can be financial, it can be spiritual, it can be health-wise. But Father, I pray through it all that we would give you the rightful place in our life. That we'd give you our life as you gave it back to us. Speak to hearts here this morning, Lord. Look at the spiritual thermometer of each person and Holy Spirit, let them know where they're at spiritually. Your word was powerful this morning. It was piercing, but yet it was still pleasant. So Father, I pray the Holy Spirit would speak to hearts in this place right now and that we would make a move to come back to you the way the scripture says to repent of whatever put us in this place to get us back on track where we could have fellowship with you the way that it should be. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? The altar will be open for you this morning because I don't want to make God sick. You say, where have you been in this, Pastor? I tell you what, I've, I, I have prayed more than you can ever imagine when I have to do sermons like this. 
because it speaks to my heart and to my mind. I don't want to be spiritually blind. I want to be spiritually open. So the altar is for you right now. You come and you do business with God. You don't have to do business with me or anyone else. This is really between you and God. You got an issue there. Uh, you got you got something you need to pray about. You need to trust Christ on. You just come right now. And by the way, let me say this: by coming, it's not revealing you've got some negative spiritual apathy. It's showing that you're spiritually zealous because you know God can fix whatever's out there. And maybe you need to pray for somebody else. The altar is open for you. Amen. You come as the Lord would speak to each and every heart here this morning. If you need to follow the Lord for salvation, would you come? There you go. Scripture says this is where we find find the help that we need. We find help that we need right here. Before the throne of God. Amen. Look, if you don't know if you're saved today and you say, Pastor Mike, would you show me how to be saved? Just slip up your hand and and I promise you I'll pray with you and I'll show you how you can receive Christ as your Savior. It's a simple thing by faith and believing. Is there anybody like that? Raise your hand if you need to trust Christ here. I, I don't see any hands. I want to make sure I don't miss anybody. But I cannot let that go without that being known. Amen. I would ask that you say, really, all joking aside, remember me and Phyllis in prayer this week as we're in Miami. We do have some decisions we have to make. We, we, we certainly think we've made the right decision. And pray for our doctor, uh, George Suarez. Uh, he's going to be performing our procedure, but we have total confidence he's the best in the country. And God opened the door for us. We believe it's ordained by God. But still pray. Still pray, please. Cameron, would you come up here with me, buddy? Come on up. When you're done praying, you, you can go back to your seat. I want to I uh, just publicly do this. Uh, Cameron's just a special guy. He's been, he's been special since he was this little. It's hard to believe he was once this little. I mean, you were never that little. You were born big like this. But, but Cameron McGee, uh, he, he has surrendered his life to go into full-time ministry. Uh, it, I've known it for a while. Uh, he discovered it. And he is our assistant youth pastor now are going to be, I mean, he feels that capacity for Omar, and he's working with the kids, and he's learning along the way, and we're going to get him a little bit of uh, education uh, in the scriptures, but he teaches, and he teaches way beyond his years, and it is his gift, and he knows now this is God's call upon his life. He's got a great mentor, and I just wanted you to know publicly that we're going to be using this young man in a greater capacity. He's going to be one of our our new young men, and and, uh, we're going to set him aside, and then there'll be an ordination service for him at some point in time. But he's one of our own. He's been raised from inside. And I just think it's great that that young men have been raised inside that will eventually take over ministry. So, Cameron, we're happy for you. God bless you. Uh, We are excited. I know your mama's proud. And uh, you, it, it's hard, it's hard. But I'm going to have him teach for you on a Wednesday night. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll give him time. So we, but he, he is just ready. And we're thrilled to have a young man like that to be part of who we are. Amen. Give him a good hand if you would. Well, amen and amen and amen. Check yourself. Be back. 
be back. The Lord will have something good for you this week, okay? Now, it's obvious if I'm getting the procedure on Wednesday, I won't be here Wednesday night. But I hope to be back uh, as soon as I can. Pray for us. Uh, we're excited about it. Don't forget Easter. The deacons have a breakfast plan. Hug somebody's neck before you go out the door. It's been good to speak to you today. God bless you.